monitor everyone. There are groups of people that see them just surf through internet, see who writes what. The thing that doesn't click in Russia's head is that it's our country that started it. If our country wouldn't invade, none of this would happen. Europeans, when they say that Russians are immoral, it's immoral for them because they see the atrocities. But for Russians, they see it differently. They see that morally these guys are protecting us. If you just stop and ask Russians, what's the goal of war? None of them will give you an answer. They will just keep repeating the same narrative. Like today, for example, it's fighting Nazis. Tomorrow they say we are freeing people of Donbass. The day after tomorrow it will be we are fighting NATO, right? Every time it will change depending on the narrative on TV. My guest today is Natalia Konstantinova, who is better known by her social media handle, Natasha from Russia. She is a popular Russian blogger and vlogger with a significant following on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where some of her posts are getting up to half a million views. She started her blogging journey a few years ago as a way to help people understand aspects of Russian society unfamiliar to many parts of the world. But since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February this year, she has provided useful and interesting insights about how this war is perceived in Russia. Natasha lives in the northwestern city of St. Petersburg, which is where she joins me from today. Natasha, thank you very much for joining me on The Voices of War. Hi, thank you for having me today. It's uh, absolutely amazing what you're doing. And uh, as I said to you at the start, you're exceptionally brave. Uh, But before we get into, I guess, the current war, I feel like we must get a sense uh, of your background. Why did you become a blogger and now a vlogger in the first place? You know, I've lived a little bit uh, abroad, Mm -hmm. mostly on uh, Middle East, as we say in Russian. Mm -hmm. So I've lived during revolution in Egypt and I lived in the Gulf area in Turkey for a while. So... When I lived in UAE, I figured out, you know, this country has a lot of experts from all over the world. So I figured that people have zero knowledge about Russia. Mm. <laughs> Every time when I ask them, what do you know about Russia? You know, they tell me, oh, bears, vodka, <laughs> and beautiful women. That's all. <laughs> it was so shocking for me. Like people, when I try to tell them stories about life mm. here, they are so shocked. Some of them were asking me, do you have fridge over there even, you know? So I figured that people have, (laughs) they don't know anything about the country. So I came home in 2000, in the end of 2017, and I decided that it's time for me to share with the world, (laughs) let Mm. them see Mm. how actually average Russians live. And I started my Instagram account and I just started to show them daily life, like Mm. how streets look like, how people think, what we do during, like, you know, during our day, Mm. etc. And then it just grew up and like, huge vlog Mm, (laughs) in the mm. videos and um, I started to have even interviews with different people so my idea was to make just Russia closer to foreigners Mm, mm. I guess as a way to build a bridge between the outside world with Russia and I guess that became very important especially since uh, the Russian invasion in February started because you were one of the I guess very few who from the start was very vocal and very public uh, about the war uh, or a special military operation, I guess, as it's uh, referred yeah. to in, in Russia. Uh, and you've been actually quite vocal about not calling it a military or special operation, but rather a war. How have you been able to do this? Is this safe for you? G- give us an insight as to what it is for you uh, to be so vocal against the war and also against Putin. How risky is this for you? You see, here's a huge difference if you speak in Russia in English, right? Mm. If you write in English or you vlog about Russia in English and if you write about Russia in Russian language. Mm -hmm. So I don't think like they really follow up with us vloggers who address the foreign audience. They don't really care what foreigners think about them. Uh, What they care is local activists, local influencers, right? So if I was actually an influencer with like million audience uh, that addresses Russians, that would be an issue. I would actually think twice before like (laughs) writing war or, you know, um, Mm. these kind of things. I would 
think more in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would be critical, but I would be probably a little bit more smarter, not that open as I do it in English. Mm -hmm. So also it might be, uh, uh, I might be biased here. Like uh, you never know in Russian, you know, you never know. Like I might think that I'm kind of protected because I speak English, but in reality, yeah, it might happen that one day I will wake up and somebody is going to knock my door and tell me, come with us, you know? Mm -hmm. What would happen if that was the case? What would you expect for somebody uh, who's been, you know, uh, speaking to foreigners and being critical and calling it a war rather than a special operation? What do you expect would happen? If that would happen with me, I, the first thing that I'm going to do is com contact lawyers, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because there are, you know, um, there are groups of lawyers that it's kind of charity. These kind of groups appeared mm. when the government started to oppress protesters. Remember when Russians start to protest a lot, they start to catch them and... Um, this and get 15 years society. jail. That's what we're hearing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, they get 15 years jail for protesting. Yeah, but even before that, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, foreigners heard about protesters only now. People mm -hmm. heard that Russians protesting only now when war started. But in reality, we're protesting for many years since like right. 2000s, you know, even before Georgian uh, invasion. But nobody remembers about that. Repressions start to happen gradually. I remember the huge shift actually happened in 2012 after Balotny case when they were close to Kremlin. Uh, Putin got scared and then they start to introduce these very severe laws to punish people who take part in protests. Mm. And since that time, people start to organize lawyers. People start to donate money to these organizations to help these protesters, mm, to mm, get mm. them out of prison, right? Or to help these people to pay fines. Because mm. first time when they catch you in protest, they don't put you directly in jail. They put you firstly, maybe for a few days in prison, right? And uh, release you with huge fine. For some people, mm. it's it's very big amount of money. Mm. It, it might be like their uh, monthly salary or mm. double their salaries. So that's what's happened. So the mm. first thing that I will do with, of course, uh, I have contacts of these people. My data is there. I just need to click one button in my Telegram, uh, right. <laughs> Telegram right. uh, chat and they will know that I'm um, detained. Right. The second thing, I'm not sure how legally they will be able to prosecute me because by law, I should say like in Russian, right? I must call it war in Russian language. How are they going to prosecute me if I do it in English? I I'm not sure how it's going to work. Okay, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I, I guess from, and this is perhaps why it's so good to speak to you because the way we perceive it, you know, in the West at least, uh, certainly in Australia, is that if you're if you caught you going to jail and that's it you know the, the, you, you don't have much chance with the law because the law the way we perceive it is that it's all ultimately decided in it's perhaps potentially just a show trial and you know mm, not no? all the time not all okay. the time there are so many cases like for example if we talk about lgbtq community mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. i think you you saw like many people were in prison yeah. for lgbtq propaganda and there was a huge case of one girl that was persecuted. They wanted to put her in jail. She was a teacher and she was released recently. Mm. But mm -hmm. it was a case of like, oh, how long? I don't remember, like one year or two years. Right. Uh, she okay. had course. So she won this court. It's not all the time that it's so uh, dramatic and so bad as it's happened with Navalny, for example, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Navalny is, you know, political. And he's a threat. Yeah, he's a political threat. Yeah, and he's a threat. And at the same time, Lush Russian repressions, they are not like Stalin repressions, like mm. how you imagine, like everyone. They just go after everyone, mm -hmm. catch mm -hmm. everyone, right, mm. and uh, murder them as it mm. was during Stalin times. Right now, it's selective. They don't have to repress everyone mm, mm, to mm. make them fear, right? Yeah. They just grab random people, sometimes like absolutely unrelated to, by the way, protests mm. or activities. Somebody was just passing by with the dog close to protesters mm. and they grab this person and it creates fear. So it's not mass rep repressions, but it's like... It's enough for everybody to fear that they could be next, even if they're completely... Yes unrelated to the protests they could be next yeah yes and that's and the scary it creates part, fear yeah. in the society like uh, yeah. there are no huge repressions but still people are afraid because they never you never know you never know who you uh, are. if they yeah. come after you or no that's um yeah and, and 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 i guess the other thing that was really interesting that struck me when you said it is that they're not so worried about who's speaking to the foreigners is that they're worried about who's has influence who the influencer is locally in russia i guess that 
could shift the domestic opinion of a particular topic, right? In this case, it would be the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, somebody who could influence millions of people in Russia, that's a threat. You, who's speaking exactly. to the Western world, I'm sure they don't like it, but in many ways, it's not really a threat, so to speak, to the regime in in, in that sense. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like foreigners, they can do whatever. Like I can say whatever for mm. foreigners, you know, mm. they do not influence on internal politics here um, mm. and they don't care about external as we see mm, mm, mm. That's because really of their true. behavior you know, yeah. we can see what they think of the West but for inside of the country of course they care, they monitor everyone there are groups of people that see them just surf through internet see who writes what mm. they talk about what sometimes like my friends, they've got threatened in comments, like they've commented under some posts on Instagram and then they've got DMs saying like, delete you know, what mm, mm. will come after you. And of course, we didn't know, like, it might be just, you know, some kind of uh, funny stuff, but people got threatened because of that. They yeah, feel like, of course. oh my God. And again, because like you know. said, if you live in that fear, if, if that's the fear that's, that's, that you're living yes. in, then of course, people are going to be more prone to believing it. Uh, more that's, paranoid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely paranoid. Now, so what, what does the average Russian believe is happening in Ukraine right now? I mean, I know that, uh, you know, it's referred to as the special operation, but is that definition actually accepted? Is that the commonly accepted uh, narrative about this war? I can't speak for the whole Russia, but yeah, you know, I live in the second largest city and mm. uh, cities are, they are more like liberal comparing mm-hmm. to, you know, countryside, countryside in yeah. any country in the world. So uh, yes, I'm in contact with people from countryside, from Far East. Uh, according to my connections, according to the bubble that I live in, yeah, 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 yeah. that's yeah, that's very. <laughs> I fair, see, yeah. um, I see a huge difference. Like in Saint Petersburg, people don't discuss war at all, and mm. yeah, they don't use any more special operation. People are pretty openly um, saying war right now, and they complain like, when will it be over? Why are we there? People get annoyed. This is mm. what I see in discussions every day. Um, every day I go, I meet people and I talk to them and I see this kind of like, they're tired and they are annoyed and they just want to continue their life without caring that something is going to collapse pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, in daily talks, people try to avoid talking about that. Like they just live day by day. And when you say they try to avoid talking about it, is that again because of that paranoia and fear? Or are people in cafes? I mean, I know when you meet with your friends, you can probably talk openly over a coffee about what you what's going on. But can you overhear somebody else? You know, somebody who you don't know at the cafe talking about it openly as well. You can hear. You okay. can even walk on the street, right, and hear somebody speaking loudly on the phone, mm. complaining, swearing at some people because they have relatives, uh, for example, that live close to the border with Ukraine, mm. and mm-hmm. they are shelled, right. Uh, or their husbands were mobilized, right? I was just, yesterday I was just hearing women screaming in the streets, shouting that they left her husband with nothing, like he has no equipment, these people don't care about us, and blah, 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 blah. So I, I don't see this kind of fear, like, yeah, you know, yeah. they don't speak about this because of fear. But this, yeah, this is my personal experience. Course, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm course. not uh, speaking for everyone. But they mostly like apathetic because they don't know what to do with it. Like they can't change it. They weren't really choosing this government. That's the problem. Like people don't understand on the West. Like they say, ah, they chose this government. So we have to blame all of them. But Mm. the problem is there is no civil society. People weren't choosing anything. They were just living, eating their food, going to work. And that's all. Mm. Mm. But what do you mean they didn't choose this government? There's no elections. Uh, I mean, how to explain? There are elections, mm-hmm. right? You can mm-hmm. see it on TV. Like, mm-hmm. oh, they, they held elections. But in reality, everyone knows that there are no elections. Even from my personal experience, uh, if, if we look at all my family, I am and my father are the only ones that go usually uh, to, to, to vote. That usually take part in elections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we go and actually vote. Others... They look at us like crazies because what's the point? Because they know that Putin is going to be elected anyway, no matter what they are going to choose. Right. And there are always frauds. There are always like 
everyone knows about it and everyone knows that that what creates this kind of apathy because yeah. people see like there is no choice what's the point yeah like we will go to elect what's the point we will, we're not going to choose anything yeah. that was the mentality in soviet union by the way that's the same mentality right now nothing mm. has been changed because no. russia in reality have russia has never had democracy you know mm, we've mm. never experienced that so people actually never chose there was always a gap between the government and people there was a some kind of contract social contract like people say okay you don't touch us we do here whatever we want to do uh we don't pay taxes right mm. we get uh, unofficial salaries yeah. you don't touch us and we don't touch you and this social contract was working for a very long time as we see but right now it's kind of breaking Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, right now government says, now you have to go and die for your country. Mm. And people look at all of this and ask, like, why Why should I die for you, you know? Mm. Okay. You didn't give me anything. And right now you send me to die for your ideals, right? And he, this is the moment when social contract is breaking. Right. And we will see when it's going to lead us because we can see that protests of uh, women, of wives, mothers, mm. of mobilized men are increasing, right? People start to speak. It finally reached, like, war came to people's homes in this way, right? The majority still live away from war. Like, war is some, it's somewhere far. It's mm, not here. Mm, mm. Nobody has an experience of that, right? Mm, mm. But when they take your, like, brother, when you, they take your father or your husband, that's a huge difference. Right mm. now, it gets personal. Yeah. And is that happening in places like St. Petersburg? Or is it still kind of uh, largely from the outskirts or the kind of poorer areas around Russia uh, rather than from the uh, metropolitan areas? You see, there's a difference. Like, big cities have big population, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that much noticeable mm. when they take, for example, 8,000 mm. Men from St. Petersburg, which is like almost six million, mm. uh, yeah, to drop in the ocean population, yeah. right? It's not visible. You will mm. not be like you walk on the street, you will not notice that something is actually going on. No, but like when I message my friends from villages, like in Siberia, mm. and they tell me they took 200 men from my village, and village is around 1,000 people. Mm. It's huge thing. Like, mm. it's pretty visible. And when these 200 people, only two from them return back home, wow. then it's pretty visible for people. Wow. And, um, yeah, I, I, I've had this experience personally. Like, my friend lives in Omsk, close to Omsk in village. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, half of his village was taken. And only two, two people from this, uh, mm. you know, 200 return back. Wow. Return back wow. injured even. They are not healthy. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. That, so, and I guess that's the, the, that's kind of leading to another aspect I wanted to explore because what we're hearing is that, you know, up to a hundred thousand soldiers, uh, have died or have been wounded so far on both sides, both Ukraine and, and Russian. So, you know, yeah. 200,000 soldiers either dead or wounded, which is, which is extraordinary numbers. Is this being discussed now more and more in Russia? I know you're saying that uh, wives are starting to protest and, and, and partners and so on, but is it gathering momentum? Is this something that there's some hope behind us that it could actually have an impact? I can't tell you for sure, honestly, mm -hmm. because I don't know how the government is going to react and uh, if they will increase repressions or they will not increase repressions. Mm. Um, it depends on many things right now. Russia is pretty unpredictable. That's mm. that's the one thing that I learned from all of this, is that <laughs> it's it's impossible to predict anything here. What, why is that? Uh, why, why do you say? Why is that? Why is that the case? Because like um, when you analyze something, you try to be rational, right? You all the time try to like collect facts and build your theory on these facts. But from what we saw, Russian government take decision based on. Uh, I don't know based on which facts, honestly, because mm. it doesn't. Many of their decisions don't make sense at all. Probably, I don't know. Putin was getting false information. I don't know what's happened there, but no sane person will go and invade his neighbor. Mm. You know, it, it mm. just it didn't make sense at all because it was absolutely clear for every sane person back then that Russia is going to lose this war. It's not going to win. It's impossible to win because these people are going to protect their country, and mm. of course, the West are is going to support them, right? And 
Mm, These people are not yeah. Nazis, yeah. right? It's yeah. absolutely like it's nonsense. Everyone knew about this. It's just our neighbors, our friends, our relatives live yeah, there. We, families, but yeah. those people who have uh, relatives, we knew everything. Like, yeah, there are problems between countries. Uh, there were always problems there, but it's not like you have to go and kill all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how they take decisions? It's like I'm trying to uh, understand it. But it just it doesn't click. Yeah, for there's me. no like, yeah, there's I, no rationale, logic behind it that you can uh, you can see. Yeah, yeah, there's probably logic, but we will know. I think after everything collapses <laughs> and mm. regime changes, and they will reveal documents, then we'll figure out what actually what's happened and why they were taking these decisions back then. Do you think that can happen? Eventually, I think it will happen. It always happens. Because Russian history is like this, you know, every time when there's new person come, uh, when new person comes, he tries to erase everything what previous person has done before him, right? So every time Stalin died, Khrushchev came and revealed all the atrocities and everything he was doing, right? And and every time it's like this, every ruler ruler of Russia has its own epoch and its own Russia, by the way. Mm-hmm. It's always different under each ruler. It's not the same as people think. Hmm. That's so interesting. That's uh, again. That's for us. That's uh, it's looking very different. I mean, for us, it looks like firstly that this was a an error, but uh, based on a calculation, you know, based on a calculation by Putin and the Kremlin that you know the West wasn't going to help. That you know Ukraine was rather weak. That you know U.S. attention was diverted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that in this was that there was a calculation there, but it was a a, a grossly underestimated uh, response by Ukraine. I, I also think so. I also think that there was some kind of agreement that they were preparing some kind of cope over there. And mm. some people just... Um, uh, yeah, it just didn't happen <laughs> the, the way it was planned. Yeah, it just yeah. didn't happen, let's say. Because if you look in the beginning of war, it just doesn't make... Nothing makes sense. Like, why they sent this Rosguardia, remember, this National Guard mm. there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, National yeah. Guard is not for war. So they were preparing to like suppress protests. But they were met with army. Mm. And so it, so many things just don't make sense. Uh, but yeah, I guess it was just miscalculation of everything. He was yeah. just getting absolutely wrong reports of what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. So so then the, the is it fair to say that, or, or, or maybe I should ask you, what percentage do you think of Russians are just apathetic about this and what percentage are the kind of hardcore for war and what percentage would be kind of on the opposite against the war? You know, so how big is this middle, this apathetic middle that uh, that's rather indifferent? It looks for me that uh, this apathetic part of the society is the majority, mm. if if not like eighty percent, so at least seventy percent of mm. it. But y- you know, you can't conduct research right now. Of that's course, the yeah, that's right. Yeah, All and, and I understand this so is much... just your uh, uh, this is your guess, best guess based on what yeah, you hear. It's so I understand my that. best guess because from what I see, like, and the problem also I can't estimate like how many against. You need to mm. know that so many people left Russia, right? All yeah. my friends that were against, they are not in Russia right now. I'm like left alone here with few of my friends that try not to speak loudly that they're against <laughs> because, yeah, they, they continue mm. living here. Yeah. And uh, So why have you stayed? Why have you not left? There are many reasons, actually. It's, um, first of all, of course, it's my family. Like, mm. I, it might seem not rational for the majority of people, but uh, I have, like, father, mother, my grandmother that yeah. is almost 90 years old. And I was thinking, what will happen if I'm going to leave them and the country is going to collapse or war will come here and they're going to be staying here alone? Mm. At least I'm young and I can manage. Like, I'm prepared, actually. I've been mm. through revolution in Egypt and um, at least I will be able to manage it. Mm. And, uh, you know... If not save them, but yeah, at least I will Help. try to save them. Another thing, yeah, another thing is it's not that easy as people think. Like, I have all my life here. I have daughter, right? I'm not like 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm 33 and my daughter is here. She goes to school all our life here. And mm-hmm. in fact, life hasn't changed like really here Mm, like people mm. go to work everything is here everything is in shops my daughter goes to school she goes to her classes everything is just like yeah no how it was 
So yeah. it's not easy. Like if I'm going to move somewhere, I will not have money. Like my daughter, she goes to school for free, right? You know, mm, Russia has yeah, a very right. huge yeah. uh, social policy. So she studies, she studies like robotics for free. She studies mm. like everything because St. Petersburg is not a village. You know, St. Mm. Petersburg is like actually quite famous city. Yeah, of course. It's not the worst place to live in, honestly speaking. Mm, of course. And yeah. Just to drag, like, take her and drag her out of her uh, bubble and her circle, it's not also easy. It's not easy decision. Of course. Yeah. And the third reason, also, I was thinking about that. I can't miss these historical moments. Mm. Like, who would also report? Who would right now sp- <laughs> speaking to you? Right? Who That's would deliver right. this information? And another thing is like. Yes, I have to, like, there, there will be definitely huge transformations in this country. I can't say how they will be positive or negative yet. I, I don't see actually positive changes uh, until now. Unfortunately, I'm not so much optimistic. But still, you know that I blog about Russia. Yeah. And that's, I, I blog not because of actually the money or I want to earn on it so much, mm, be a rich mm. person. I blog just because it's something that uh, I have passion for. Yeah. Like, I, I love it. Actually, I love to explain to people and they come to me and say, yeah, that's a huge inside, you know, mm, mm. thank you so much. And you feel like you're doing something really valuable in your life. Yeah. Well, you're a communicator that, and, and you're doing something very special. You're providing the world a, a, a very unique insight into the rush, into the Russia of today and the Russian mindset. And I think that's admirable and rare and unique and hugely important because I think where we don't see the human side of Russia. Uh, and it's very That's easy. It's very easy for us to fall into the camp of hating all Russians, right? It's very easy exactly. for, for people to do that. And we see this. I mean, you and I talked about this uh, a little bit before we started, the kind of quick divisions that you see on on Twitter and TikTok, uh, how quickly people get go to extremes because they have one idea and one vision uh, and yes. they make – you know they they paint the entire country with that single brush and and you're doing something to help uh, alleviate that exactly that's the point also i felt like this responsibility you know when the war started uh, a lot of actually journalists reached me and they were asking me and uh, i was speaking openly mm. and i was trying to deliver a russian point of view and after that, after these videos, actually many Russians, they messaged me and they were telling me like, at least there's somebody who speaks for us. Like, thank wow. you for doing this. Yeah, wow. And you feel like you are doing something important because it's not only for foreigners. Okay, foreigners mm. Uh, mm. understand, but for these Russians that are in very complicated situations, these Russians who are against this war, but they can't speak, for example, because of yeah, because they are scared or yeah, yeah. for other reason. They can't speak and English, they feel, <laughs> for example. Yeah, yeah or yeah, they can't yeah, speak yeah. English yeah, at all. Like, yeah. they are not heard. Mm. And uh, I remember I was almost crying when I, um, there was a documentary I was taking part in um, for Canadian TV. Mm-hmm. And I said there, like, I'm actually, yeah, I, I'm speaking here alone. But behind me, there are like hundreds, thousands of voices that can't be heard. So it's not just me speaking here right now. Yeah. And people messaged me after that, like, they oh, thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you for doing that. And I felt like, damn it, I, I can't just leave. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm some kind of at least link. At least I can, I can at least these voices can be heard through yeah. me, but still. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's uh, important. Absolutely. I was just going to say, it's really important. And I think, I think it's, uh, I, I know that there's a lot of interest uh, even amongst the people that I've mentioned uh, that I'll be speaking with you because we don't hear the everyday Russian's perspective uh, at all. But one thing that I want to pick up on is that uh, you said that life hasn't changed much for you in St. Petersburg. So what impact are the sanctions having on everyday life in Russia or, 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 or are they having an impact? Actually, sanctions have a huge impact, but average people, they don't notice it. That's the problem. Like whenever I speak with my friends who are in business, mm. it's a huge drama, right? The only thing that I hear, it's usually <laughs> when I say, how are you? It's usually swear words and yeah. how everything is bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, how they you, like hate the government and everything. Uh, they try to manage, but there are many issues in different kind of industries, sometimes absolutely invisible before. Like, for example, 
you go to shop right now, you see these packages of juices, uh, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Juices were very colorful, everything. And right now you go and it's just plain, like blank white color. And what's happened? Because, yeah, this dye that they used to buy this uh, color mm -hmm. was all imported. Huh. So they didn't have it. They have to reduce. And what do you ever think? Like, that would be the issue. Or packaging, Tetra Pak uh, mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. Russia. So you go and the packaging right now is not Tetra Pak. It's like brownish color, weird pa Russian packaging. So you see this kind of changes, but directly they do not affect. Like there's still juice, right? Mm, yeah, okay, yeah, it's white, yeah. but there's yeah, juice. It's still juice. Yeah, uh, yeah. Coca Cola left. Okay, uh, factory is still here. They still produce, but under another name. Mm. It's still the same Coca Cola, but right now it's called Dobry. So mm. technically, yeah, you don't see Coca Cola anymore, or you didn't see McDonald's, but it's the same stuff. Like we go to this um, McDonald's that they uh, bought, right? Mm -hmm, that they mm -hmm. took. <laughs> mm. And it's not any different. Like the same ice cream, the same food. I mean, even people, they don't call it Vkusnetoshka, they call it McDonald's. They say, let's go to McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, because it's part of the, the cultural uh, vocabulary. Yeah. So technically for them, nothing has been changed. For cars, okay, spare parts, um, it's a huge problem. Uh, my businessman friends were driving, I don't know, BMW. And uh, yeah, right now they have to put uh, not original spare parts, but Chinese spare parts. Mm. In money matter, it's the same. Nothing has changed for them. But yeah, you know, it's Chinese. It's It won't be that good as original German. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, car is moving. Yeah, it's car is moving, of course. But on daily matter, it, average people don't see these huge effects mm. uh, yet that much maybe some who have diseases for example severe diseases like uh some medicine disappeared right mm. now for example a few days ago antibiotics disappeared i know that there is no maxicillin uh mm. there is no maxiclav this kind of brands that used mm. to come from abroad mm. and if you're not sick you will not know about this but when you're sick you start running and searching and then figure out that yeah there's no there's uh, medicine Wow, and it's a huge problem. Yeah, and, and but you said at the start that that it's a huge problem, that it's having a huge impact. It's just that people don't see it. So where is it having the impact? Uh, is is there, are there broader kind of uh, macro economic impacts that uh, are likely to hit at some point that people are going to feel? Yeah. as in beyond the kind of die missing and and uh, you know Coca Cola being rebranded into something else, are they likely to actually have an impact on everyday people at some point? It will, because like um, like how we see, for example, in major industries, like if you are in, um, if, if we speak, for example, about plane industry, right? Mm. Uh, one of my friends is, um, used to be a pilot and mm -hmm. right now he's not a pilot anymore because they reduce stuff so much because there are no planes. They <laughs> don't fly mm. anymore right now, right? So for right now, planes are flying. People are still using them. They don't see the difference. But in reality, what's happening, they don't have spare parts, right? Mm. So they start to, as we say, cannibalize old airplanes to get parts, at least to like let them continue flying. But what's going to happen in a few years? Mm. Uh, people don't think of it, right? The same for healthcare. Like you go to dentist, most of their supply, again, my friend is a dentist, right? And... Uh, <laughs> I was just talking to him yeah, yesterday a lot of friends. again. <laughs> he is, uh, yeah, because of blog, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm, he's a foreigner, yeah. by the way, and mm -hmm. he lives in Volgograd. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a uh, foreign, uh, I mean, he studies dentistry there, and I was just talking with him yesterday. They don't have feeling, like, he goes to practice uh, in clinic, right? Um, dentistry yeah, yeah. to fix people's teeth, and they don't have feeling. Wow. So they have to put, like, old Soviet feeling for teeth, and he says, I don't know how it's going to work. Like, it's pretty bad. And I know what he means because I was treating my teeth in the 90s and I'm aware of how bad it is. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So these so these kind of things will incrementally erode life as people know it, but it might take a while. Yeah. Yeah. It might take a while. It's slowly. Like, I go with my dog. There is no vaccination for dogs anymore. There are okay. no vaccines because most of our vaccines used to come from Australia Huh. Uh, and the other, by the way, uh, foreign countries. There's right. no vaccines. What we're going to do in a few years? I don't know. If government is not going to decide this kind of, solve this kind of issues, there will be a collapse in many things. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that they are actually trying to solve. I mean, they are trying to find ways, right? They build some factories. 
if you, by the way, noticed, I wrote some thread on factories that were opened in mm, September. Mm, mm-hmm. And I'm going to do the same for October, by the way. And I'm going to follow up with them also, see if they are working uh, in future, because it's also interesting how yeah. they're managing it. But, but maybe maybe, so, maybe give us an insight into that as well, because I'm sure not everyone has seen it. So, so maybe tell a little bit about it. Uh, it's a huge list, actually. Mm. Every... <laughs> Every month, there are still factories, sometimes huge factories that are opening in Russia. Like, but I think, um, like most of these huge projects, you need to know that they are subsidized by government, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, if government will not have money, they will not be able to continue to with these projects. It. So, mm. I think by time, the number of these factories are gonna be reduced because government doesn't really have money. It, okay, it doesn't have money. Again, that's not necessarily what we seeing here as well are we seeing that you know russian government is making more money due to its uh, gas yes. and oil exports and uh, because the, obviously the price of uh, gas and oil has gone up so that it's uh, yes, you it's, know, it's making more money than it uh, actually has prior to the invasion yeah yeah it, it's fair for the time of the beginning of war mm. but right now as you see the problem is they are going to implement ban on russian uh, oil right yeah. in december mm-hmm. so and um, the, the supply of gas also mm-hmm. dropped so much to Europe. Uh, many countries refused to buy gas. And f- what I was reading yesterday, I saw that the deficit in budget of my city, for example, uh, was way higher than in previous years. Mm-hmm. We didn't know for sure because you know they made new laws and they, they make it secret. Some. Mm-hmm articles of budget so we can't see where this money actually yeah uh, yeah yeah you know, where this money goes and where it was spent to so i'm not sure we will see by time but i highly doubt that russia will be able to cover this this amount mm, mm. of export Ex- that they were yeah. exporting to europe with china or asia there is no infrastructure even to cover this you know this huge yeah. volume that was being uh, sent. supplies mm. this volume yeah yeah. I highly doubt. That's really interesting. So so what information is available in Russia to everyday people about the situation, both via traditional and social media? I mean, how controlled is the information that people have access to? And perhaps most importantly, what information, it doesn't matter what's available, but what are people consuming? You know, what are people watching? What are people listening to? Yes, that's the, look, that's a good question because Everything is available Mm -hmm. if you search, right? If you're just uh, curious, everything. Like I read BBC in Russian, right? I read like everything. Mm. I have no issues with that. But the majority of people, that's the problem. They are not that curious as me. They don't really have time. They go to work, right? Mm. They come home and they won't just lie on the sofa and relax uh, until next day. And watch the TV. Want to spend, yeah, yeah, watch TV, play, I don't know, Counter Strike or something mm, like that, mm, yeah, or watch mm. football. So what they do is like uh, I always measure by experience of my parents because yeah they are like average people. My dad uh, is a teacher. He comes from work. He opens TV and watch Russian propaganda state channels, right? And what mm. do they say there? Um, I think you all can see yeah, yeah. Uh, in your news also as well. Uh, some people analyze it like it's mm. uh, it's absolutely nonsense most of the times. Pretty easy to debunk anything they say. Mm. But do people spend time to go and search to debunk it? Of course, no. Most of them become like zombies and they just repeat the same thing that state TV says. And mm. even if we look at, like, you, you're going to tell me, like, not everyone is watching TV. Of course, not everyone watches TV. But most of Russian uh, media is controlled by the state. Mm. So whenever they go to the internet and they check Russian news, right, uh, it's going to be owned by Putin's friends or relatives' channels that will, will post only a certain opinion you will Mm. never see something different Mm. they will not be able to go and see bbc popping up right Mm. never because Mm. in order to read bbc you have to install vpn not Mm. everyone knows what vpn is and it's not stable in most of cases so you have to spend some time for that yeah yeah so the the learning curve is quite steep to even to even get access to that 
different information. And most people won't have the time or the interest or the will. Uh, and I guess yeah. coupled with the fact that you said that most people just want to live their lives because they have to yes. earn their living, they have to feed their children, they have to feed their families. And I guess that's not, you know, that's not totally dissimilar to the West in many ways when we're talking about the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan, which were wars that were over there, right? So yeah. even though, even though Absolutely. for you it's, relatively close it's just next door but you both russia and ukraine are big countries if it doesn't affect most people's lives it's very easy to you know it's just happening over there let me live my life let me live my life simply and do what i need to do to feed my family and uh, put food on the table exactly it's actually so shocking for me because honestly i can tell you honestly that i was expecting a completely different reaction uh, from russian society when mm. uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. This, I still remember this first day when we woke mm. up and I saw these bombings of Kiev. Uh, and I ran to, like, I live with parents together. Uh, mm -hmm. I ran to wake up my mother and all of them started to run and shout, like, what the hell they're doing? Mm. The, you see, the, the first reaction is genuine. That's mm. the point. Mm. Before propaganda yeah. started to work, people started to shout, like, these crazy politicians, we should do something. And then propaganda started to work, explaining them that they are Nazis, bio labs, you know, this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, and right, they are yeah. like, okay, so yeah, that, that makes sense. And that's all. Is the everyday Russian hearing about or in any way finding out about you know, the atrocities, war crimes that are being committed, civilians that are being killed, even just now this kind of latest bombing of the electric grid, you know, where... You know, I think a third of Ukraine was without power uh, just in the last couple of days. Is this getting through to the everyday Russian? Uh, you need to um, to understand that when there's war, there's always war propaganda, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So first, war, first rules of war propaganda is dehumanize your enemy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. One of the first. So, of course, what they do is they do not show Russian atrocities, but they show Ukrainian atrocities, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So they dehumanize. The same thing that the Ukrainian part does with Russians mm -hmm, right now, mm -hmm. Russians do with Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the same story. I, yeah. I, I sit in both, you know, um, yeah. communities. I read the Ukrainian and read Russian and I see absolutely the same techniques mm, like course. people lose humanity in all of this like mm. they, they see you see they they rape our children and then Russians say you see they um, uh, they kill collaborators uh, mm. they kill these Russian people and if you look at all of this and you feel like there's no end to this um, yeah yeah both sides are doing awful things but it's um, the thing that doesn't click in Russians' head is that it's our country that started it. If mm. our country wouldn't invade, none of this would happen, mm, mm, right? Mm. There wouldn't be any atrocities. So they try to keep people away from all of this, not to show them, of course. And uh, every time when the West try to show something, like remember the story with the Mariupol Hospital, yes, uh, uh, yeah, remember the Butch and all this kind of That's stuff. Right. Of course, they're like many questions about that but still it's everything is proved already you know mm. we see videos we see like russian soldiers shooting people killing people what what's questionable about that but still when but you it's very about, easy like, to Russians, make the narrative that you know oh that's a false flag operation those are yes. those are those are cia or those are yes. you know nato or whatever i mean it's a yeah this yeah. is not true they they make even programs uh like to debunk Ukrainian fakes, to show that it's all fake mm. and people are not real and this is not real and this is, you see, that was a, that was edited, you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah, of course, that's right. Yeah. And people believe, yes, they look at it and they say, yeah, what well, you believe. And if you try to um, deliver some information to them, they will tell you that you fall under Western propaganda. So you just repeat the same You're stuff. You're brainwashed. And yeah. Yeah, your brain washed, and it just goes in circles over and over again. So, so what does victory look like to the everyday Russian at the moment? Then, given everything you said about the narratives, and let's let's assume that most are happy to swallow the propaganda because they, you know, realistically, it's very difficult to bypass the propaganda because it's everywhere, and if that's all you're hearing, um, so what is what does what does victory look like? You know, at which point? Will the Russian people say, "Okay, we've won, and that's that's enough now"? You know, in this moment, 
to answer this question, I need to firstly understand what was the goal of war? What's actually to win something that should be clear mm. goal, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. if you go to invade, what's your goal? To take resources, to take territories, or to kill, uh, I don't know, to remove this uh, terrorist or mm-hmm, something like mm-hmm, that. There should mm-hmm. be a goal. And then you build a plan, right? Strategy, mm-hmm. how you reach this goal. So what's the goal? If you ask, if you just stop and ask questions like, uh, what's the goal of war? None of them will give you an answer. They will just keep repeating the same narrative. Mm. Like today, for it's example, it's fighting Nazis. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Tomorrow they say we are freeing people of Donbass. Uh, the day after tomorrow it will be we are fighting NATO, right? Mm. Every time it will change depending on the narrative on TV. So mm. actually, deep inside, nobody understands what the goal. Mm. So in order to win, what will be considered as a win I have no idea mm. because I don't know now what's the goal of all of this. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. That's, That's interesting. the point. And I was just thinking about this. And I think that even if Putin tomorrow will stand up and say, That's all, we're leaving Ukraine, we fulfilled all our, I don't know, goals uh, and mission. yeah. missions. Yeah, uh, yeah. People will believe it and accept it and say, Okay. Do you think this is a, a Russian problem uh, that they are prone to believing propaganda, or is this just humans? No, I think, yeah, it's just a human problem. You know, the laws of propaganda weren't invented by Russians, by the way. Uh, It was tested on many people. We've seen these examples in history. Uh, It wasn't so long ago, right? Um, Germany even. And um, I I haven't lived in the whole world. I don't know. Like, I have to Mm. still travel and see. (laughs) But, I, yeah, I communicate with Americans every day because most of my um, audience on TikTok is American, Mm. by Mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. And I see that, the yeah, the closest mentality to Russians are actually Americans. Like, I see the same problems they face because America also have their own propaganda, you know, yeah. and uh, brainwashing. And they understand me the most when I say, like, when people come, Europeans come and tell me how people can believe that uh, there are Nazis. I say how people could believe in um, that there is no COVID, that mm, there are mm. some, like, this QAnon theory, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pedophiles that are eating children, all this kind of stuff. That's right, yeah. And then, yeah, they say, damn, yeah, you're right. It's exactly the same. Mm. Uh, or anti-vaxxers movements and all this kind of un- mm. unscientific stuff that's mm. going on in the world. Mm. Like, mm. Yeah, It's you're just right. the same. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Yeah. And by the way, the interesting part that people who understood me the most, by the way, when the war just started and they saw me fighting with haters and explaining... People who understood me the most were American uh, soldiers, people Hmm. who served in Afghanistan, people who served in Iraq. But yeah, they are my, by the way, supporters, uh, people who are donating money to me just because they like what I'm doing, Mm. you know, not Mm. like to support me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, it's something. But yeah, just to support because I was giving them um, uh, like the perspective from inside. And they were the first who messaged me back then and uh, tell me, like, I, I know what's going on. Like, I... I've been there, you know, Mm. Americans also had this kind of guilt, uh, those who served there in Mm. Iraq, and they've seen all of this, and they completely, like, understand me when I was talking about this war, like, it didn't make sense at all. Yeah, this dehumanizing part also of people, like, they're they're just average people that live here. It's not like, they are not orcs, they are Mm. not some kind of robots, they do have empathy, actually, Mm. because you can see, it's, it's absolutely, like, mind-blowing because you can see this babushka that shouts like yes our boys they are fighting nazis there she supports mm. and at the same time she goes out and feed cats there right she's yeah. taking care yeah. she's uh, sitting home and knitting uh, socks for her soldiers that yeah. it's just the people uh, europeans when they say that russians are immoral it's immoral for them because mm. they see the atrocities but for russians they see it differently. They see that morally these guys are protecting us, yeah. right? So it's morally good for them that yeah. these people are protecting our country. These guys go to like uh, so to die for our freedom. Need res- yeah. Yes. Yeah. Need to, because they are Nazis there. If not our boys, they are going to kill us all. So if you look from this perspective, mm. you don't see it. Like, they don't have morals. These yeah. morals are just different perspectives. Everybody the thinks point. they're the good guy, right? Yes, yeah. that's the point. Yeah. And then in in eventually we have like 
two nations just killing each other and dying, mm. as you say, like it's uh, around one hundred thousand. By the way, we don't know about numbers. And yeah, of Russians course. have no idea. Mm. Ukrainians, if they show on TV, right? They show every time uh, how they bury their soldiers, mm. right? These people crying, how they like it's a it's a huge the like, honor they fall yeah. yeah yes yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they honor all of them and it's like a huge tragedy each death is a huge tragedy mm. for each ukrainian in russia you will never see that people don't even know they might live close to graveyard of these soldiers fallen soldiers and they might not know that there is graveyard mm. are they coming back are the, are the bodies being brought back do you hear about it i mean does, is, is that something that's even in the public discourse at all no, it's no. not in like it's not in news. It's like I don't know. Uh, Do not people hidden, know? Like, Do people know how many have died? Is this something that's no, a, no, okay, at all? Wow. They don't know at all. That's why I think if we just had free press and free mm. TV, like it was in the nineties, mm, mm. remember, like uh, when Russia had problem with the uh, Kursk submarine, it was a huge thing on TV. The whole Russia was like blaming uh, government for mm. that, comparing that time to right now there are just few people died there in this submarine mm, mm-hmm, comparing mm-hmm. to nowadays yeah, now. yeah and it was a huge thing that almost destabilized the country because right now we don't have free tv free media i mean people have no idea yeah it's it's something left in houses uh, people just mourn their you know at home privately they don't talk about this yeah that's scary that's scary maybe uh, uh bringing it towards the end what what is, what is your biggest fear and then what is your biggest hope right now uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question actually um yeah the biggest fear i think right now that this war is going to continue for years and it's not going to stop any soon and there will be way more casualties uh that there're going to be a disaster how's it called technogenic uh disaster mm. like something mm. will happen with power plants mm-hmm. nuclear power plants right that will affect millions of people not only in Russia and Ukraine and the third one is the um complete collapse of Russia and fall into civil war that's the like because i <laughs> i understand what might happen if Russia is going to fall into pieces and it's not I'm not so optimistic as foreigners because I know what Russia is mm. and what's going to happen if it's going to fall in pieces and go and if it will be under the control of some thugs mm. and, um, you know, this kind of people. There's mm. nothing good out of it. So what is your biggest hope? Uh, I don't even know what I hope for right now. That's the point. I wasn't thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest hope is, of course, the... Um, peace negotiations that finally these people will reach uh, will reach some agreement let's say non-violent agreement when they can just stop all this madness and mm. uh, what i what i wished for is of course return back all the territories to ukraine you know just stop it pay the reparations and continue living as normal countries of mm. course huge changes in russia that i was hoping for like uh, changes uh, in the matter of how the government works i mean i would like to have actually a real federation when mm. there are real heads of federal like we call it federation but we are not federation mm. in mm. reality like mm. you know it's quite centralized and everything yeah. yeah it's centrally controlled and there's no power uh in regions mm. so there are discussions about like it's better to make it a republic and all this kind of stuff yeah but at least I want this discussion, you know, I want free discussion so people will uh, be able to get uh, places in government, they will mm. be able to take part in decisions. Mm. That's what I hope for. But how is it possible right now? I don't, unfortunately, I look at reality and I see that uh, Russia is moving not to a good dir- direction. Mm. It's, um, I see that, that there might be probably fights for power pretty soon. And um, that would be not the people that you or I want to be. That yeah. won't be a liberal cope. That, mm. w- that won't be a liberal transformation of the government. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that elsewhere from some analysts uh, who know Russia and Ukraine very well. And they have warned that, you know, while in the West we might say we want Putin out of power, what comes after Putin might be even worse. Uh, and I think yes. that's the that's Yes, a and theory. that's what I see. Mm. That's probably, uh, that's why, I mean, I, uh, 
all my life I was advocating for Putin to leave mm. because there wasn't a position in Russia that I saw that might take the charge of mm, the country mm, in mm. case of hope or anything. But right now, as we see our liberal opposition out of the country or in mm. prison, oh, in jail, there yeah. is nobody, yeah. Yeah. nobody. So who's left? It's thugs and Islamic conservatives, right? That might lead uh, something. Wow, yeah. That's not a good option at all mm, mm. for none of us. Yeah, and and perhaps last thing is, uh, I think it's worth mentioning a noble effort of yours. You're actually heading out to Mariupol uh, pretty soon, in a matter of days, uh, if, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, just uh, uh, for people to get an understanding of what you're actually going out there to do? I was searching for many months, actually, how I can be useful for those people who are in occupation right now, right? Unfortunately, I can't help Ukrainians like in Ukraine mm. at all. I mean, I can't donate uh, legally because, mm. you know, I will be prosecuted tomorrow. Uh, I was helping people here. Yes, in St. Petersburg. Uh, we were helping these people who were evacuated from eastern Ukraine mm. to our area. In the beginning of war, there's so many people who came here to cross uh, the border with Estonia. I mm. live close to the mm. border uh, yeah. with Estonia and Finland. Mm. So many People in St. Petersburg were just volunteering, delivering these people to the border, let them escape, you know, yeah, if they wanted. Yeah, yeah. Nobody stopped them, by the way, it was their choice. Many people stayed. They're still here. Like They still live close to St. Petersburg, people mm. from Mariupol, by the way. Mm. And still there are volunteers, even the teacher, one of the teachers of my daughter, by the way, she's in these groups. Mm -hmm. uh, so she sends them uh, clothes, she sends them, like, they need everything you know these yeah. people came with nothing they came with flip-flops and like wearing usual pajamas sometimes yeah, so yeah, they yeah. have nothing and usual civilians it's not governmental it's mm. not like organized by government no it's like we have chats in telegram mm -hmm. you know yeah of course yeah and small chats where people like hang out we collect stuff we send with uh, some volunteers who have car to, mm, to drop it the off. settlement so i've been al always like searching for opportunity what else can i do and i found also some civilians it it was it wasn't planned. I was just reading some local Russian, uh, you know, influencers, and mm -hmm. I, I've just found this group of guys because they were like advertising mm -hmm. uh, their um, fundraising, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I've contacted them, and I was following up for a few months. They were going to this Mariupol delivering heaters to people because people are going to freeze there. Government mm -hmm. left them. Uh, Russia doesn't really uh, like do anything in the matter of administration yeah. there, right? They built, it's true, they built good road there. I've seen it with, from videos, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when the guys traveled. And I will go, I will record. They built actually some areas in the city, like... My like brand new buildings, you can see. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. this very beautiful buildings and everything. But again, I spoke with these volunteers and they told me, like, the majority don't live there. Nobody lives there because, okay, you give them flat, but it's empty. Mm. But these people lost everything how they're gonna live yeah. in this flat right now there's no like stove there's mm, nothing mm, it's empty mm, flat mm. just walls mm, so mm, that's mm. why people don't live there wow. and uh, i figure that many families uh, are still in mariupol no these are not russians like many you know many people start messaging me like oh these are russians that move there to leave to take over territory <sighs> yeah like, would you go? Like, if I will offer for you tomorrow, like, let's move to Mariupol, right? You are going to live in these um, awful buildings. Would you move? Of course, no. Nobody is in insane mind would move there. It's very risky. They die there mm. every day. They're still shelling. They're still, like, it's mm. dangerous area. Mm, mm, mm. So even, as I told you before, like, even people um, delivery cars, mm. they don't want to go there. It's only private drivers that decide that they want i mean they can't take this responsibility and they go companies mm. don't go there yeah, companies yeah. don't want to be um associated with this um it's it's very complicated you know for companies uh, situation because this territory is not actually russian yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, russia says it is but yeah. companies usually don't want to you know they, they, they try to stay away from all of this yeah yeah, yeah. of course yeah so it's private groups of people that organize all of this and i was i was raising also funds for them 
So I collected money and I'm going to pay directly to producer of heaters. Mm -hmm. They will connect me with the guy and I will just transfer directly to this um, mm -hmm. producer. And we are going to deliver these heaters in a few days to families that actually need them. Yeah. That's it. And winter is well and truly starting to set yeah. in as well, right? Temperatures have really already dropped uh, significantly. Yes. So this is potentially for some of them life-saving uh, heaters. Absolutely, yep. because, yep. Uh, you know, like, okay, young people, they might organize, mm. you know, they, yeah. they might survive, you yeah. know, it's people, they even in the worst conditions ever, yeah. people find ways, but elders. Mm. And children, elders, right? There are children just, there too as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah children, uh, ch children with families, especially elders, they, they can't move, they will not move mm. so fast mm. as young, at least young can, you know, move, do something. Yeah. If they're gonna freeze, but elders know, and I don't know how they're gonna survive. They will just fall asleep. I will not never wake up. Yeah, yeah. that's why um, I was following up with this group of guys who were traveling there. You know, they record also videos. They show what they do. I've seen it with my own eyes. What mm, they do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, I contacted the organizer personally. We spoke. He explained to me everything. It's actually pretty transparent um, and I am mm. transparent as possible you know mm. I post mm. every day how yeah, much money right. we get and yeah. I will post how much we paid and I will show up because I will hand this heaters personally that's mm. why I'm going there personally mm. wow. Um, wow. as well that's incredible I mean I, I think well firstly that's admirable uh, and yeah, I, I take my hat off to you because you're brave on so many accounts uh, I, I know you won't necessarily feel that you feel like it's your duty but I think uh, yeah just I guess look around and not not everybody's doing it. There's only a small number of people that, um, you know, uh, it's, they go the extra mile. I, I guess. know that. Yeah, it's it's sometimes like I think um, I was just speaking yesterday with my best friend. You know, she asked me, and I told her, you know, I think that I'm going there actually not not like not to record stuff to mm -hmm, show to mm -hmm. foreigners or something like that. More than I go there personally for me. Mm. Um, yeah. It's it's been really like hard time all these months to see and you know to watch all of these deaths and it's done in your name, suffering. right? Yeah, yeah. And it's done, yeah, under yeah. like my name that I'm yeah. Russian and I yeah. I completely understand this hate that comes from Ukrainians. I mean, I understand like I I've seen them all sitting there and shouting like why are they, you are killing us and yeah. you are not protesting and I absolutely understand why um, people behave this or that way. Mm. So all these months, yeah, I was like, I, I didn't know what I'm going to do next. Like, yeah. I, I spent all these years, you know, trying to make Russia close to foreigners, mm. trying to explain it. And then I felt like it's just everything was devalued during one day. Like yeah. I could just trash everything what I was yeah. doing in, you know, in trash can. Yeah. It was all for nothing. Yeah. Well, I don't think it was for nothing. I mean, I think you're you're you you have a special role to play right now. Even just speaking to me, I think you you you're certainly going to open, you know, the eyes and ears of some of my audience at least. So you know, I think this is yeah. Uh, I think it's certainly helpful to hear the other perspective because we don't get to hear it often. Yeah, I, I I'm glad that I can I can share with you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's really not something we talk about. Yeah. That's, you know, you see, that's, I think, the huge uh, problem why this war also happened and why generally wars also are happening is this dehumanization that is going on mm. and that the absence, actually, of dialogue between yeah. people. Yeah. Because, like, seriously... Uh, people live know, in the their questions. bubble, like you said. People live in their yes. bubble, right? Yeah. People yeah. live in the bubble and, like, whenever... I just open the door a little bit for them. I show, like, I travel around Russia. I show that villages, you know, I'm, I'm not like this fancy blogger mm. that shows everything perfect. It was actually opposite. I used to so much complain. I used to show, like, bad parts. Mm. And at the same time, good parts. Like, it's not always, like, black. And it's not always mm. white, mm. you know. Yeah. yeah, And that's why I think people um, valued me also as well because I'm not showing only one side of it mm, and mm. they see this usual human beings that live in these villages they just do their they raise their children they also the same like watch American shows by the way mm, they yeah. um, 
sit on the internet, play games, just yeah. the same, like any person, like, I don't know, this John in uh, somewhere in the US uh, yeah. Yeah. is absolutely the same Ivan that lives here in Siberia. Yeah, and right. if they meet together in reality, they would just sit together, drink vodka, and uh, they will be best friends. Believe yeah. me, I've seen it so many times yeah. in my life. Yeah, that's right. And that's in fact a, a big part of this podcast is to is to, you know, scratch below the simple narratives of war, uh, which is what we're unfortunately being exposed to on a day to day basis. Um, on, on that note, Natasha, I really want to thank you. We've uh, gone well beyond, uh, I think, what we originally agreed on. I, so it was absolutely. I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I can speak. No, I was so about to apologize ago. to you for, uh, for for keeping you away from uh, from your very busy. Uh, an active life uh, but I really do want to thank you for giving me so much of your time I think this was a very special conversation for me and I think most of my audience will recognize how important this conversation was uh, and I wish you best of luck in Mariupol in the next couple of days and I'll be eagerly watching uh, on social media how it all goes and of course I will be sharing it uh, with my networks uh, but uh, yeah I certainly look forward to speaking again because I think this was again yeah this this was a really important conversation thank you thank you have a good day Thank you for listening to another episode of The Voices of War. And since you got this far, please take a moment to like and review the show wherever you get your pods. Also, if you're able, please consider showing your support through our Patreon page. The link is in the show notes. Thank you, and until the next time.